lots of time this week as I have. I've enjoyed the, the messages. I've enjoyed the fellowship. And going to enjoy the, the privilege and the blessing to be able to open up the Word of God with you here this morning. Um, my message, as has been stated, is um, what is heaven like? <clears throat> I got to thinking about that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I uh, think about all those passages in Ezekiel and Isaiah about men who saw the heavens open and saw the train of God and all the stuff the heavenly scene. That's not what I'm going to be talking about. <laughs> all right. Uh, actually, the, the sub theme to my, my topic is uh, what do we have to look forward to in the ages to come? What do we, the body of Christ, have to look forward to in the ages to come? Now, the answer to that question does address uh, the idea, though, or the question, what is heaven like? To know what heaven is like is to have a clear understanding <clears throat> what we, the body of Christ, have to look forward to in the ages to come. And what we have to look forward to in the ages to come is our glorification. Now, how does one... I'm going to talk about a couple of things here before I actually get into the subject of our glorification. But how does one become a member of the body of Christ? Because the question is, is what do we, we who, have to look forward to in the ages to come? And the we is the body of Christ. If there's anything you learn about rightly dividing the word of truth, every we in the Bible isn't you. Okay, every us, you know, is not you. So what do, how, do, how does one become a member of the body of Christ? Well, one becomes a member of the body of Christ by believing the gospel, the gospel of the grace of God, which was given to the Apostle Paul. I want you to take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And one of the things I've come to learn to teach from this passage here is that everything for you and I begins with the revelation of Jesus Christ to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. That's where everything begins for you and I today. Okay? That Christ Jesus came into the world to save Sinners, how be it, for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now Paul is our pattern in the demonstration of the long suffering. Not in everything that Paul did is he our pattern. But he is most certainly our pattern in the long suffering that was displayed or showed to him on the road to Damascus. And that long suffering is salvation. It's a, it's a dispensation of salvation, you might say, a dispensation of grace, we call it. But it also should be thought of as a dispensation of salvation. And he says, for a pattern to them which should hereafter. Believe on him to life everlasting. Now, when you think about the body of Christ, it is a separate and distinct entity. It's a unique entity. It is a new creation of God. Separate and distinct from the nation of Israel. The body of Christ is not a continuation of, of Israel, it is not a, a, a if the word amalgamation, the idea of a, 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 a buying. Well, Romans eleven is what most people think uh, the way 
denominationalism generally teach um, how the body of Christ or what they think about the body of Christ is composition, what makes it up. And in Romans 11, it talks about being the, the Gentiles being grafted in. And generally, people take that being grafted in, the Gentiles being grafted in, is they, they identify that as the body of Christ. That's generally how they think about the body of Christ. Well, the, the church, which is the body of Christ, is not grafted into anything. It is a new creation altogether, separate and distinct from Israel. The grafting in of the Gentiles, the idea is, is Romans 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall, God forbid, but rather through their fall, what? Salvation is come unto the Gentile. And that's generally what the grafting in is about. It's about the opportunity of, or the sending of salvation to the Gentile. But that grafting in has nothing to do with the body. It is in that context, it's in that setting that the body of Christ is created or formed. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. <clears throat> Wherefore remember, Paul writes, that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes or once were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Now what he describes there in those verses, again going back to Romans 11, 11 and 12, the fall of Israel, the sending of salvation to the Gentiles. But in Romans eleven fifteen, 15, he, he, he describes it or he refers to it as the reconciling of the world. For if the casting away of them, the casting away of the nation of Israel, be the reconciling of the world. And what that idea is, is about making both Jews and Gentiles one. It's doing away with the distinction between Jews and Gentiles. And so there when he talks about um, in verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off or made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace who hath made both one. God made both Jews and Gentiles one in unbelief first. He Romans 11.30, he's concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. So you have there first and foremost the concluding of the reconciling of the world, the concluding of Jews and Gentiles first in unbelief that he might have mercy upon them all. And the way you do that with regards to the nation of Israel, you have to abolish the law <clears throat> and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Now, why did he do all of that? For to make in himself of the two one new man, so making peace. And that's the beginning of the church. That's where the church, the body of Christ, come into being. Okay? And God initiates that first and foremost. Thank you. First and foremost, by the revelation of Jesus Christ to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. So when Paul talks about that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So God forms the church, the body of Christ, beginning with the salvation 
of the chief of sinners, Saul of Tarsus. But how do we become members of the body of Christ? And as I've stated, you become a member of the body of Christ by believing the gospel Paul preached. No one becomes a member of the body of Christ save Paul without believing the gospel Paul preached. Now that answers a lot of other questions too. When you, when you consider that. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Now, the body of Christ begins with the fall of Israel. Okay. After the fall of Israel, with the, the revelation of Jesus Christ to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, when it talks about how we become a member of the body of Christ. In verse 13, it says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all to make, made to drink into one Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ. Now, that's how you become a member of the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit of God baptizes you into the body of Christ, places you into a living, dynamic, inseparable union with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is the kind of identification that Paul describes in Ephesians 5 as becoming bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. We become so totally and completely Identify with the Lord Jesus Christ that when God looks upon us, he doesn't see us. He sees his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, because we are in him. We've been baptized into him. We've been totally and completely identified with him. And what's true of him becomes true of us. As uh, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 21 says, he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And everything that he is, we in him, that is true of us. Okay? But we are baptized by one spirit into the body of Christ. Now, that baptism is the baptism of Ephesians 4, 5, the one baptism. It's a spiritual baptism. It's an operation made without hands. It is to be distinguished from being baptized with the Spirit in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, the, the Lord Jesus Christ is the baptizer. And he's baptizing the kingdom saints with the Holy Spirit. And they are empowered with the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 is the, Holy, is the work of God, the Holy Spirit, taking a believer, taking one who believes the gospel, believes the gospel of the grace of God, that moment, that instant, places him again into a living, dynamic, inseparable union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Upon believing the gospel, we'll look at a verse on that for a moment. But that's the work of God, the Holy Spirit. Those are not the same baptism. And the results or the consequences of those baptisms are entirely different. Okay? Your life is not automatically <clears throat> experientially changed when you believe the gospel. In certain areas, you might think of your life being automatically and instantly changed. That might be the area that you were wrestling with, fighting with, and dealing with and became convicted about. And after hearing the gospel, <clears throat> getting saved, and that's not, but everything else about your life is pretty much the same. You know, if you had an attitude before you got saved, you got one after you get saved. <laughs> You know, it, the, 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 the believer is not automatically 
spiritually mature. Okay? You have to grow. Um, in Ephesians 4.17, um, Paul talks about when you, not to, um, in verse 17, he says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. When you got saved, the only kind of a mind you had before you got saved was a vain mind. And that is what you have built up and stored up in, into your, your life. And that's what you function. That's, what you re, that's how you respond. You respond based on that history, that, that learning, that development over the years. When you get saved, one of the things Paul makes abundantly clear to you, you can no longer, you should no longer, and, and, and walk based on the mentality or the mindset you had before you got saved. The thinking, the wisdom, the understanding that you had is no longer adequate or sufficient for you now that you've become a member of the body of Christ. And there's nothing about the wisdom or the understanding you had before you got saved that would suit you. Nothing. And so you have to be totally and completely renewed in the spirit of your mind. Okay? So the Holy Spirit places us into that Dynamic, inseparable union with the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I was trying to remember where I was going with all of that. <laughs> uh, my point is, is in, in uh, 2 Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But that, that begins with the Holy Spirit baptizing you into uh, the body of Christ. You become part of this new thing that God is doing. Now, if you, if you go to Ephesians 1.13, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, in becoming a member of the body of Christ, again, you... You become a member of the body of Christ by believing the gospel Paul preached. And upon believing that gospel, and by the way, why would God the Holy Spirit identify you with the Lord Jesus Christ? Why would he baptize you into the body of Christ? Why would he do that? Well, Ephesians 1.13 is the answer. In whom ye also, what? Trust it because of you trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not trusting in religion. You're not trusting in a denomination. You're not trusting in a philosophy. You're trusting in a person. And that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're putting your trust, as Paul writes in Acts 13, 38, be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And that's why you would put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to have your sins forgiven. We sin against God. We've offended His holiness and His righteousness. And there has to be a satisfying of that. Romans 3.25 whom God has set forth. God has set forth the Lord Jesus Christ to be that satisfaction, the propitiation through faith in His blood for the remission of sin. To have your sins forgiven. In whom you also trusted. But when do you come to the place in your life you put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? The verse is real clear, but oftentimes people have different ideas about how they came to faith in Christ. And they have all kinds of experiences. But not one experience any one of you have ever had has ever led you 
to put your faith and your trust and your confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so he writes here, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And it's the gospel of your salvation. Because again, I say to you, salvation for you doesn't begin until the revelation of Jesus Christ to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. Romans 11, 11 and 12, again, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentile. And it is not the same salvation uh, that God had sent to the nation of Israel. Okay? That salvation has been interrupted. That salvation has been postponed. The Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 4 said, salvation is of the Jews. And that prophetic program, that program about how God was going to bring salvation to the rest of the world was dependent with, upon the nation of Israel. In thee, God told Abraham, in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And the nation of Israel, God's multiplied seed, was to be the channel of blessing to the nations. Look at Acts chapter 2. I make that Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3, beginning at verse 25, Peter says to the nation of Israel, Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant, which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. And for that reason, verse 26 says, Unto you first, God having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. Now that would explain a lot of things. Matthew one twenty one: Thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins. And in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the focus of, of salvation and the plan of salvation was to save the nation of Israel. If they're the key, if they're the, to be the channel of blessing to everyone else, and they have a problem, you have to resolve their problem first before you can begin to deal with the rest. And so he says, Unto you first, God having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. And again, that would match what Jesus told Israel. Salvation is of the Jews. In Matthew 15, when the Syrophoenician lady came to the Lord pleading with him to heal her daughter, he answered her not a word. She began to cry after the apostles. They came to him and said, Lord, send her away for she crieth after us. And he said to them, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then he says, it's not right to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. He said, let the children first be filled. Now, he didn't say give them the first chance or the first shot at it. He said, let them first be filled. Let them come into their blessings. And when they come into their blessing, then salvation, as Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 2 says, then salvation shall go forth from Jerusalem. You remember when he sends them out in Matthew 10. He tells them, don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Samaritans. But go ye rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then later on, he tells them down in verse 23, before you've gone over the cities of Israel, the Son of Man would have returned. In other words, before 
the nation of Israel come into their blessings before they realize the promise that God has made to them. Before they come into those blessings, the Lord Jesus Christ will return. Okay? When he ascended up in Acts chapter chapter 1, there was to be no expectation of the establishment of that kingdom upon the earth until the second coming of Christ. What did that mean for Gentile salvation? Gentile salvation would not be a, be a focus until after the second coming, until Christ has set up his kingdom. So when Romans 11.11 11 says, I say then have they stumbled that they should fall, God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentile. It's not the same salvation that is to come to the Gentiles after the salvation of the nation of Israel. This is an entirely different salvation. This is an entirely different message of salvation. And that message of salvation is preached beginning with Paul. Okay? One other passage, and I'm going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Beginning at verse um, 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. And God demonstrated that. He demonstrated that again, I say to you, by the revelation of Jesus Christ, the Saul of Tarsus, on the road to Damascus. As was pointed out in Matthew 3.11, you have a, a, a simple outline of the prophetic program. You have the baptism of John that's covered by the Gospels in the early Acts period. Well, we can say the Gospels. And then you have the baptism with the Holy Ghost that's covered by the early Acts period. Okay. And then you have the baptism with fire, which was to be the next event on the horizon. The next event to be fulfilled. They rejected John's baptism. They rejected the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the twelve apostles. The next, and, and as Jesus said, you blaspheme the Father, it will be forgiven. You blaspheme the Son, it will be forgiven you. But if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, it won't be forgiven you in this world nor in the world to come. And so the next thing on the horizon was to be God's wrath. In other words, what's, what, what is to follow the pouring out of the Holy Spirit? The pouring out of his wrath. And by the way, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit was to, to empower, to, to equip the kingdom saints to go through that period of time. They were not the object, that is the kingdom church was not the object of that wrath. But there are other forces at work during that time of wrath that would make them the object of... They were not the object of God's wrath. Okay. And so, with the persecution that would come against them, the equipping, the way God would equip them and, in, and empower them to endure that time of trouble was with the Holy Spirit, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. But that... Pouring out of the wrath was the next event on the horizon. But rather than pouring out that wrath upon Israel and upon the Gentiles whom Israel had now joined in their rebellion against God and against his anointed, God ushered in the dispensation of grace. And he demonstrated his will that all men be saved and to come unto a knowledge of the truth by withholding or suspending, interrupting the day of wrath and the day of judgment. And that's why it's called the dispensation of grace because of the absence of God's wrath and judgment 
upon the world. Who would have all men to, to be saved and to come unto a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now watch. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be what? To be testified in due time. Before the revelation of Jesus Christ to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. The preaching that Jesus Christ gave himself a ransom for all. The time before that was not the appropriate time to preach such a message. It was not until the concluding of the world in unbelief. Making no distinction between Jews and Gentiles. And and the issue became whether or not you were in Adam or whether or not you were in Christ. In Adam, the Bible says, all die. But in Christ shall all die be made alive. And it's not not until you come to Paul is such a message began to be preached. And it centers in the cross work of Christ. It centers in Christ and Him crucified. It centers in in preaching how it is that not only uh, answers the question how how it is that God, as, as Romans 5, 6 says, when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Not only that, it says why we were yet sinners. In due time, Christ died for us. Why we were yet his enemies, Christ died for us. The cross explain the preaching of the cross explains how it is a holy and righteous God can offer salvation uh, so freely to such ungodly men. The cross explains how that is. The basis of it all. Because God poured out His wrath, His judgment against sin upon His Son upon Calvary's cross. And that enables Him to offer to you and to me and to the world grace and peace. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when you think of our salvation, it's threefold. There's justification, the book of Romans. By the way, I think some, uh, someone was dealing, where do, you, where do you start someone reading, and, I think it was Brother Russ, where do, you, where do you start someone reading and studying the Bible? You know, the the traditional answer is the Gospel of John. Okay? And then after you read John, they, they then instruct you to go back to Genesis and read forward. The problem with that is you never learn the truth that God would have you to learn for today. Because Romans 16, 25, and 26 speaks about the preaching of Jesus Christ according to what? The revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Guess what's not in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. It's not there. And it most certainly is not in Genesis to Malachi. You don't begin to read about the preaching of Jesus. Prior to Paul, you preach. Jesus said it himself in John 5, 39. Ye search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have what? Eternal life. And he says, and they are they which testify of me. Um, in Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which was written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the psalm concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scripture. But prior to Paul, or in the... the, the you, you have the... the Presentation of Christ, the preaching of Christ according to prophecy. Romans 
1, 2, for example. Um, and the verse doesn't jump out at me. So Romans 1, 2. Well, verse 1 and 2. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Now, verse 3 tells you what the gospel of God is. It concerns his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. But verse 2 speaks about the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scripture. The Lord Jesus Christ is the subject of the law, the prophets, and the Son. And Paul is separated unto preaching Christ, preaching the Christ of prophecy. Okay? He's separated to preaching that very Christ, not another, but the Christ of prophecy. But he doesn't preach him according to prophecy. Again, Romans sixteen twenty five and 26 says he preaches him according to the revelation of the mystery. And so when you preach Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, the, the, the salvation message is threefold. Your justification your sanctification, and what? Your glorification. And that's the the area in which I want to speak to you about uh, briefly here at 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 this juncture. But again, I want to say to you, to know what heaven is like is to have a clear understanding of what we, the body of Christ, have to look forward to in the ages to come. The hope of the gospel is our glorification. Now, let me tell you what. Get um, 1 Samuel 2, verse 8. I want to, uh, this, this particular verse is just simply to, to convey the idea. It, it, it was a verse that conveys the idea of what I'm intending to communicate about our glorification. First Samuel, chapter 2 and verse 8. I want to read this verse and then I'm going to make another statement afterwards. And I think you begin to see the, the connection. But thinking about our glorification. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust. And he lift, lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill. To set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. Now, that's generally the idea of what God's plan is for you and I as members of the body of Christ. Our glorification, our being received up into glory, appearing before the judgment seat of Christ, and position in the heavenly places far above all principalities and powers and mights and dominions and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world and in that which is to come. Giving the Lord Jesus Christ preeminence over all Things, as Paul writes in in Ephesians one twenty two, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. And when you begin to think about your glorification, that's what and, and that that First Samuel two eight kind of put you on the the thinking how you should be, begin to think about that. And when you think about 
the life that now is and then the life that is to come. Well, that's, the, that's our glorification. Our being caught up. And by the way, when, when you think about our, about our... Look at 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3, um, verse 16. Paul writes here, he says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and what remaineth? Received up into glory. That's our glorification. Okay, being received up. But it's much more than that. But, but that's what it is. It's being received up in to glory. And the process that starts that out is what uh, Brother Steve talked about when he was talking about the rapture. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. You see? And mortality shall put on immortality. Okay? Um, our glorification begins at the rapture. Now, I, I, I had another thought about that, but I, I'm not going to try to sort that out with the time. But I actually believe our, our glorification began when we got saved. <laughs> okay. Um, but in a, as one that is saved, as we who are saved, we have our justification. We have our sanctification. There's one aspect of our salvation yet remaineth. And that's the redemption of our body. Go over to Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8. Beginning at verse 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That glory is not now, it is future. And this passage for me, people always asking you, you know, about healing. And show me, in verse, show me a verse in the Bible where God has st stopped healing. And if there was ever a passage of Scripture to, I believe, unequivocally declare and teach that God is not in the business of miraculous, physical, bodily healing today, this would be the passage for me. Because of what it teaches about our glorification and the impact that that teaching is to have on us here and now. And if miraculous, physical, bodily healing was, start, was still part of God's working, still part of the, the believer's experience today, it would totally and completely undermine the hope of the gospel. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, because if God is going around healing you and addressing all of those temporal problems, then what, it, what advantage then or what is the significance then of the hope of the gospel? He says, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Right. That's right. You see? Right. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who have subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Glorious liberty. Okay. And not, uh, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together 
until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we with, uh, with, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for what? Waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Now, how do you, how do you, if, 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 again, if the healing program was still in operation today, that is completely undermined. That is completely destroyed. For we are what? Saved by hope. But notice what the next statement says. But hope that is seen is what? It's not hope. If God is healing you, then why would you need to be looking and waiting for the redemption of your body? You wouldn't. That earnest that is to be set in the heart of every believer is that that blessed hope. And that is destroyed if the healing program is still operating today. For we are saved by hope. Hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man sees, what, why doth he yet hope for? So our glorification, our resurrection, our exaltation into the heavenly place. And I'm not going to have time to get into some of these other things, but I'm just going to mention them very quickly because it would be incomplete if I don't say these things. In Ephesians 2, 7, Paul speaks about that in the ages to come. God is going to show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. I remember the first time I heard Pastor Jordan preach this message, he had it entitled Trophies of Grace. And that's exactly what Ephesians 2, 7 is talking about. Trophies of grace. When you think about a trophy, it's a prize or it's a victory of success. It's a souvenir of an achievement. Now that tells you God was doing, God is doing something in this dispensation of grace. Okay. Um, It's a memorial of victory. And that's what the ages to come have in store for you and I. We're going to be a memorial of God's victory over Satan, sin, and death. Okay. For all, for, as the verse says, uh, in the ages, plural, in the ages to come. And again, this is a, that verse is a verse about what God has done for us through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is going to be a, mem- a memorial of God's victory through Calvary. Now, I, I know I've got to quit, but, um, but when, you, when you consider, go, look at First Samuel 2, 8 again in closing. As I began to study and prepare prepare for this message, it became abundantly clear to me how little I know and understand about what, you know, what's in store for us in the ages to come. But I did begin to get a a glimpse. And again, that's why 1 Samuel 2, 8, is so meaningful to me. He raises up the poor out of the dust. He lifted up the beggar from the dunghill to set him among princes and to make him inherit. We're going to be set above all principalities and power. We're going to be judging. the. We're going to be ruling over all of these things. And uh, so our glorification is a future expectation But it is a hope that we have that enables us now to endure the sufferings of this present time. That's the importance of it and the bondage of corruption. 
Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel of grace. And we, we thank you for every facet, our justification, our sanctification, and the future expectation of our glorification. And that is a full gospel. And we pray, Heavenly Father, we learn to appreciate every uh, aspect of it to the glory and to the honor of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.